Hello and welcome to Future Proof, where I nerd out about classic sci-fi staples and their real-world counterparts. I'm your host, Michael Swain, winner of slightly fewer Emmys than Dan O'Brien. You may recall that on our first episode, I lauded my friend for winning two Emmys. I'm your host, Michael Swain. That's right, Daniel O'Brien may have two Emmys, but I'm back doing videos on Cracked and making references from the early aughts. So who's really hashtag winning? Don't answer that. As many of you pointed out in the comments, he's actually won five Emmys. So what I'm telling you now is that the number I've won is described by a figure lower than that. So yeah, I appreciate the corrections. And I just wanted to say, he ain't gonna f you, bro. And I mean that in the nicest possible way. To Daniel, who's my friend. To you, it's spite all the way down. Spite which almost interrupted my main point, which is that today we're discussing light amplification by the stimulated emission of radiation, or lasers. God, acronyms are so stupid. Swaim winks and intro. Michael is my name. Once again, in case you missed it, or any M word would have worked, misanthropy is good. Back to lasers. Lasers probably got their conceptual start shortly after humans learned to shape glass and realized that sunlight can be focused to a deadly point, significantly lowering the average lifespan of the common ant. Interestingly, even the more refined ideas of death rays and ray guns were already ubiquitous in sci-fi long before Theodore Maiman created the first real-life laser in 1960 by shining light through a ruby prism coated with silver. That's a pricey laser! Hope it put out after. That's right, I sincerely hope that Theodore Maiman had sex to completion with a ruby rod. Sue me. Sorry. Surely one of the first popular depictions of lasers in fiction was the invisible heat ray the Martians use in H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds in 1898. Superman's been shooting x-rays from his eyes since the 30s and heat rays since at least 1949, which of course means he could have easily melted Meryl Streep the day she was born and spared us the constant oppression of the last seven decades. Oh, my producer's telling me I'm mixing up Meryl Streep and Vladimir Putin again. Whatever. The point stands. Lasers were immediately popular, probably because they let sci-fi include the fictionalized spree shootings that we all love, while differentiating itself from your average modern day feats of gunplay. Energy weapons feel like an upgrade from bullets. Even though they aren't, it's an easy but satisfying effect to pull off on camera. Everyone loves the pew pew sounds that we all landed on for what a laser sounds like. Get in there, you big dummy! And unlike every gun, except that multi-purpose one from Fifth Element, so cool, a fictional ray can boast a variety of uses. The most common made-up laser is probably the James Bond, a visible red line that cuts through anything. As most of us know from playing with our cats or blinding international airline pilots with a laser pointer, laser light doesn't make sound and is actually only visible if a space is filled with fog, dust, or other particulates it can bounce off of. As if the Gilmore Girls wasn't proof enough, real life is never quite as spectacular as depicted on television. They just talk so fast. Why can't I talk that fast? But lasers, phasers, blasters, or whatever you want to call them, have plenty of other functions. Star Trek's phasers, you know, the ones that think they're too good for a normal trigger pulled by an honest God-fearing index finger, can heat up rocks to warm food or people, harmlessly stun rather than kill, or full-on disintegrate someone until they're just gacked into ashes. This is thanks to their adjustable power setting and a made-up thing they squirt out called nadion particles. In Star Wars, on the other hand, blasters work by superheating gas into plasma, the fourth state of matter and stuff that stars are made of. Then magnets or the force or something concentrates it into a beam. I don't know, it's pretty silly. And I don't only say that because I'm a Trek guy, although I did cry when Captain Sisko returned to the present and reversed Jake's aging spell. You okay, Dad? I am no Jake. God damn it, I need to cut. Let's cut. All right, let's get back in. Can I get last looks on monitor? Oh, come on! Obviously, that's not gonna work! You were gonna let me j Please, Mom, pay more attention. You look great, sweetie. Here's the thing. I personally give Trek the edge because at least their lasers function like real light does. 
as in at the speed of. Anyone who's ever turned a flashlight on, I'm looking at you plucky kid detectives everywhere, understands that light traverses space pretty instantaneously. Same reason the light bouncing off a distant baseball player enters your eye a second or so before the sound of the bat hitting the ball reaches your ears, and up to a full five seconds before the ball hits you in the face and renders you unconscious. To this day, I still fear balls. I can only pee through the flap. Which of course naturally brings us back to Star Wars and the trusty blaster pistol Han would rather have at his side than literal f***ing mind control magic, but okay. Blasters emit what some wags have dubbed a slow laser, meaning a discrete line segment of laser that you can track with the naked eye or deflect with a saber. Not only does this defy the laws of physics, it makes blasters infinitely less effective than even a standard issue military sidearm, which can propel little chunks of metal at about 2,700 feet a second. To put that in perspective, that's even faster than under 12 parsecs, because parsecs are unit of distance and not velocity. More like Han so low a grade in astronomy he should be embarrassed. Yeah, more like that. And while a laser beam that can immediately render someone unconscious is about as unrealistic as a karate chop or single punch doing the same thing, there are analogous non-lethal ray-based technologies already in the world. Ultrasonic weapons like LRAD, the long-range acoustic device, are capable of emitting sound at extremely high levels over long distances. It was initially designed to negotiate with hostage takers from afar or deliver emergency information to large groups. But naturally, the cops got their hands on some and just started cranking that shit to 11 and pointing it at people. The LRAD has since been used to forcibly disperse Black Lives Matter, anti-Trump, Antifa, and Occupy Oakland protests, as well as the 2017 Women's March. Wrap it up, ladies! A related tech, called a magnetic acoustic device, or mosquito, is being developed in the UK to emit high-pitched frequencies that only young people can hear and get annoyed by in an effort to prevent teenagers loitering. So it's like they say, women and children first, especially when it comes to who we shoot invisible waves of pain at. There are military heat rays already, too, that work on the same principles as your microwave, although they call them active denial systems instead. Humancrowave didn't test well. But believe me, when people start feeling themselves microwave, they disperse. Dispersal is virtually guaranteed. Big bet on dispersing. It could be considered unfortunate that in real life, non-lethal lasers still burn and damage your eardrums instead of gently laying you to sleep on the lush carpeted floor of an interstellar starship, but everything's relative. And the reality of laser lasers is so much worse. For scale, a laser etcher and engraver tool has a laser power of about 65 watts. A commercial grade 4,000 watt cutting laser can slice through carbon steel an inch thick. Current day military lasers range between one and 400,000 watts. So far, the main early application of these absolute units has been defensive. Have a targeting computer point a laser at an incoming drone, rocket, or missile, melt that sucker out of the sky. Right now, these rigs are huge and usually mounted on something like a plane or aircraft carrier that can support a turret. And they all have stupid military acronym names like Helsi, Eldu, Fell, and Y'all One, which I guess is better than Reagan calling his laser Star Wars, but still not as cool as my suggestion. Fleshlights. You know, because they're light that burns flesh. And yes, I have had sex with several, but that's neither here nor there. We do things for science, okay? things we're not proud of. The really scary thing about real lasers, beyond the fact that they're fully in the hands of cops and government, is that they don't just punch a little hole or cleanly cut through anything, instantly cauterizing the wound like in movies. <laughs> Naw, dog. That shit straight up boils your cytoplasm and explodes your insides. By all accounts, getting killed by a laser array is much more damaging and horrific than the ballistic equivalent. And although they are currently restricted to battleships and tanks and such, that's only because they eat up so much power and cooling. As those systems improve, and humanity learns to produce more power from less stuff, as we're always in the process of doing, it's conceivable that a powerful handheld or backpack-style laser could be in our future. So if another Uvalde happens in 50 years, you can rest safe in the knowledge that a bunch of undertrained cops will be standing around outside looking like the Ghostbusters, wearing lasers that could have paid for your kid's college, and whose only purpose is the complete demolishment of soft targets for the purposes of enforcing the government's will. Okay, sleep well. I'll see you next time, when our topic will be FBI mech suits that shoot nukes at anyone whose phone overhears them say the word abortion. Bye now!
Okay, bye-bye. Bye, everyone.